Hello and welcome to this Rygate Grammar School Biology Department video on tissue fluid, considering it at AS level for OCR Biology. We're looking at tissue fluid. First question, what is tissue fluid? Huh, I can hear you asking that question. It's one of the questions you've always had, I know. Tissue fluid is filtered blood. It is the plasma, the fluid part of the blood, filtered through the capillaries and out into the tissues itself. The tissue fluid then ends up bathing the cells of our tissues in water and with all the solutes that are with that water, the sugars, the salts, the amino acids, all those things that we know that the cells need. How is it formed then? Let's just have a quick look at this diagram here. Here's our artery and we've got blood coming along this way from the heart. That has been pumped out from our left ventricle under high pressure generated by that thick ventricular wall and down it comes through this arteriole here. And this now is a capillary and fluid is forced out of these capillaries into this interstitial space here, this interstitial space. It's called interstitial fluid and then it starts coming back, we get uh, fluid coming back into the capillaries from the tissue fluid and on it goes and back out ultimately to the vena cava via first of all this venule down here. We're going to look at how this happens looking at the structure of a capillary and looking at what substances therefore leave. This is a nice drawing of a capillary and you can see it's made out of these cells here. These are endothelial cells. You can see each one has a proper nucleus because it's a proper cell. But of course its key feature is that it's very broad and very thin. Flat and thin. Meaning this distance here is very small indeed. Therefore the wall of the capillary is one cell thick and that cell itself is itself very thin. We also have in the capillaries these pores. These are gaps between the endothelial cells and they are often otherwise called fenestrations. Coming from the French word fenetre, I assume. Um, I guess there's a Latin word in there as well somewhere. So let's have a look at how the process works. I've already drawn this on here and you can see it's my drawing because it's clumsy and clunky. You're going to have to forgive me that. If you don't forgive me that, there's not much I can do about it at this stage. Apologies. We start at the arteriole end with fluid moving in this direction as per the arrow. Down at this end we have hydrostatic pressure which is high. So the hydrostatic pressure at that end is high and by the time we get to the venule end the hydrostatic pressure is low because of the resistance through the capillaries. The total surface area of the arterioles is probably pretty similar to the total surface area of the venules. Um, the pressure in the middle of the capillaries uh, is also pretty low because the total surface area of all the capillaries is very large. So what happens because of this high hydrostatic pressure? Fluid is forced out through these endothelial cells and in particular of course through the fenestrations. Travelling straight through the endothelial cells will be water. Diffusing out of the red blood cells there will be O2. There will also be lots of ions and glucose and so ions so we've got Na plus, Cl minus, we're going to have glucose. Now of course Na plus and Cl minus and glucose, they're going to struggle to cross a phospholipid bilayer except with protein carriers and so a lot of them will come through the fenestrations directly um, while water can cross straight over here. Of course there are carriers around for glucose and Na plus and Cl minus but they won't go directly across a phospholipid membrane. Now what happens with our oxygen? Well, that's going to go to this mitochondrion here. Did you guess that was a mitochondrion? Well done if you did. Likewise, the glucose will go to uh, that mitochondrion or to another one here. And they will, of course, produce CO2, those mitochondria. CO2 will now be at a high concentration in these cells. It will diffuse into here down a concentration gradient. Left behind in the capillary are cells. So the red blood cell, that's far too large to leave the capillary, so it won't go through. 
Also, plasma proteins. Here is a plasma protein. I'm sure it looks like this. Now, these plasma proteins around here, they are too large to leave the capillary. They affect the osmotic potential of the blood plasma, but they will not cross out and go into the tissue fluid. What happens to the water potential as we go along? Well, our hydrostatic pressure is high at this end. That's fine, that forces fluid out, but it leaves behind these proteins. And that means overall that the osmotic potential, i.e. the water potential, lowers here. So we get low hydrostatic pressure here and also a lower water potential. This is going to help us return fluid back to the capillary. So at this end here, with a lower hydrostatic pressure and a lower water potential, water can be returned back like that. High hydrostatic pressure here and a higher water potential means that fluid is forced out at this end and low hydrostatic pressure here with a low water potential means that water is drawn back in that way. A couple of other things to think about before we go on to think about these pressures with some numbers is first of all another waste product, urea. Urea will be made by cells, in particular will be made by the hepatocytes of the liver and urea will diffuse into there and you will get a higher urea concentration at the venule end of the capillary than you will at the arterial end of the capillary. That will be true of any excreted product that is excreted into the blood. And the last thing I want to think about on this slide is the exit of phagocytes. Let's draw one here now. So this chap here, again I seem to have assigned a gender to a phagocyte. Phagocytes have no particular gender. This is a neutrophil and it is squeezing its way out of the capillary. And as it squeezes itself out, it uh, then becomes considered to be a macrophage and it's got this lobed nucleus here that we can see. There it is. Let's do a little bit of colouring in on our lobed nucleus. So our friendly macrophage is now going to be out in our tissues patrolling and trying to do phagocytosis to anything it might find there which is which is foreign, so you might find some bacteria and do some phagocytosis for that. But that is the topic for a different video. Now, during an infection, it is wise to allow your fenestrations to get larger so that your phagocytes can get out of them. How do you do that? One of the ways we do that is we secrete histamine. Now, histamine widens these fenestrations. As these fenestrations become wider, so our macrophage can get out. But also, these proteins start being able to diffuse out. Now, if proteins can diffuse out, that means we get a lower water potential outside of the capillary and higher outside of the capillary. Therefore, if we have a lower water potential out here than we do in the capillary, we get less water returned back into the capillary so more fluid hangs around in the tissue. This is why you get swelling. So if a mosquito bites you, you release histamines in that area, you let a whole load of proteins diffuse out of your plasma into the tissue fluid, more water ends up there and you get an itchy bump because there's more fluid around in that bit. Let's have a look at some numbers. These are numbers taken from your OCR textbook and in the arterial end we have green arrows representing hydrostatic pressure apologies if you are red green color blind hopefully it's not too much of a problem here we go and 4.3 kilopascals in there and 1.1 kilopascals outside so overall we have a net hydrostatic pressure going out of 3.2 we also have an effective water potential drawing water back in now for the purposes of this diagram here, you'll have to slightly ignore what we've said about plasma proteins. Just take these numbers as they are for the time being. We have minus 1.3 in the tissue fluid. Remember that water potential is always negative. And so we've got 2 going back in. So minus 2. And so our net 
flow or our net pressure going out is 1.2 kilopascals. Well, what about our net flow going out here? Our net flow going out is plus 0 0.5, but here again we've got a minus 2 going from there to there. So our net flow is minus 1.5 kilopascals, our net outflow is minus 1.5 kilopascals, and therefore our net flow in is plus 1.5 kilopascals. That isn't the whole picture. We thought about tissue fluid now and how we get it formed going out this way, largely through hydrostatic pressure forcing it out, and then through water potential and osmotic pressure drawing it back in, and then the fluid being returned to the vein. But we also have this, we have excess tissue fluid getting drawn into the lymphatic system. So this is our lymphatic system there, and a lot of fluid gets returned this way. It doesn't all make its way back into the capillaries at the venule end. This is a close-up of, of a lymph vessel over here, and you can see a feature it shares in common with veins. It has pocket valves. Just as in the veins there is not enough residual pressure from the heart to push the blood along back to the heart in the vein, so it is true for the lymph system as well. And so it has these valves to prevent backflow, and then when muscles contract around it, when skeletal muscles contract around it, that will squeeze the lymph vessels, pushing lymph along in this direction. And once it, as I say, once it ends up in these lymph vessels, it is called lymph. This is how that lymph is then returned to the circulatory system. It comes along a lymphatic vessel, and that drains into a vein, drains just actually quite close to the heart in the vena cava, and that returns it back to the circulation. Thank you. I hope that's helpful.